In March of 2001, D.F., a 52-year-old American, was having trouble falling asleep. But something was off. This wasn't your usual bout of insomnia. D.F. was used to those. He was naturally a night owl and had always been a short sleeper. This was different. Over the next several months, D.F. would sweat profusely and his hands would develop a tremor. He would experience short spikes of fever. It was when he began experiencing short-term memory loss that D.F. finally decided to see a doctor. What followed was a several-year-long battle waged across America, all inside the mind of one man. This is Fatal Familial Insomnia. At the hospital, a DNA test confirmed the worst case scenario. It turned out that DF had a single, very specific, and incredibly rare mutation in his prion protein gene. This invisible cellular error, spelled out in genetic code, is nothing less than a death sentence. The doctor told DF he had fatal familial insomnia. Fatal because, in every case of FFI ever reported, the disease invariably and inevitably led to death. Familial because it can only be transmitted to the people closest to you, your children. DF's prognosis was grim. He could expect months of worsening confusion, hallucinations, motor system destruction, and worsening insomnia that would eventually erase any ability to enter the deep, restorative sleep that we all need. The life expectancy after diagnosis with FFI is anywhere between 7 months to 3 years. However, DF's case is anything but regular. His DNA contained another super rare mutation, a methionine substitution on both alleles of the prion protein gene. This ultra-rare variation meant the disease would progress even faster through DF's brain. At this point, he was already 10 months into the disease. He likely had just another few months to live. None of this was making sense to DF. If this disease really ran through his family, how was this the first time he'd heard of it? Then he remembered his father, dead at 76. He remembered the tremors, the confusion that ransacked his mind. At the time, he put it down to old age or dementia. But maybe it was more. A confrontation with his mom confirmed it. DF's dad was a victim of FFI. So were two of his cousins and his paternal uncle. She knew about the family curse, but, for better or worse, chose to keep it secret from her son. As an avid nutritionist with a PhD in naturopathy, DF was not going down without a fight. He decided to try as many different treatments as possible, starting with plain old vitamins and exercise and veering into the experimental with ketamine, narcoleptics, and stimulants. Around the same time, DF vowed to make the most of his limited life. He purchased a motorhome and planned a solo trip across the United States. He drove only after a refreshing rest, often waiting days between trips for sleep to arrive. Before taking the wheel, he forced himself to recall details like his social security number, his date of birth, and more. He would only drive if he could remember everything. Still, his worsening insomnia made everything difficult. DF said he sometimes found himself in places with no memory of how he got there. Sometimes, he'd look at the date on a newspaper and realize that several days had passed without him realizing. Eventually, even the strongest of treatments were failing to force him into sleep. The cocktails of vitamins, sleeping drugs, anesthetics like ketamine and chloroform were barely working. By month 16, DF spent most of his days as a motionless mute, stuck in a limbo between sleep and consciousness. On occasion, he would get up for a drink of water, instantly forget why he got up and sit back down. He'd do this for hours on end, never actually getting the water that he wanted. His body temperature rocketed up, sometimes reaching 102 degrees Fahrenheit. He'd sweat profusely, had seriously limited short-term memory, lost all sense of time, and had trouble separating reality from fantasy. He'd look back at notes he wrote himself days ago and found them impossible to read. Sometimes he'd even hallucinate while driving, seeing people in the road when there were none. DF didn't let any of this stop him from driving hundreds of miles across America and would use stimulants to perk himself up while driving 60 miles an hour down the highway. 
he kept this up for five months before his worsening insomnia forced him to hire a driver and professional caretaker. At that point, around month 18, nothing but the strongest treatments could lull him to sleep. At about the 19th month of his illness, DF was inspired by a grand mal seizure that he'd suffered recently to give electroconvulsive therapy a try. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT for short, essentially works by giving the brain a seizure by attaching electrodes to certain parts of the head and giving it a hearty jolt. DF hoped ECT would literally shock him into sleep, and he was right. Over the next several weeks, DF forced himself through 30 sessions of ECT. A sort of sleep followed each session, but they came with horrible side effects, including the loss of several years worth of memories. Although the memories eventually returned, DF never wanted to repeat the experience. 22 months into his illness, DF bought a sensory deprivation tank. At this point, he'd startle awake from his drug-induced sleep at the slightest noise and needed total silence. A sensory deprivation tank is a big cocoon filled with warm water that is pitch black and totally silent. Laden with narcoleptics and half-submerged in warm salt water, DF was finally able to catch a precious few hours of sleep. However, when he awoke, he suffered horrifying hallucinations and was often unsure whether he was alive or dead. In the end, after years of traveling and living like this, DF finally succumbed to his illness. In this time, he suffered heart problems, including a heart attack and stroke, contracted diabetes, suffered seizures, had kidney problems, and more. He also successfully drove hundreds of miles and wrote a book. Due to all his experimental treatments, DF lived nearly a year longer than expected. So how did this man, who was once described as brilliant and extremely funny by his friends, degrade so quickly over just two years? Much like Alzheimer's, mad cow disease, and creutzfeldt jakob disease, FFI is a prion disease. This means that, either through genetic mutation or environmental factors, a certain protein in the brain has seriously malfunctioned and, like a rogue AI, has turned on its masters. In Alzheimer's, these bad proteins affect different regions across the brain, leaving it looking like a block of Swiss cheese. In FFI, these proteins focus on killing just one part of the brain, the thalamus, a walnut-sized lump near the center of the skull. This is a huge uh-oh moment, because the thalamus controls a whole load of regulatory functions like temperature control, heart rate, motor signals, and yes, consciousness and alertness. It takes a while for this to kick in. Most patients with FFI develop the disease between the ages of 40 and 60. Fortunately, there's no way you can catch this disease. You must be born with it. Unfortunately, if one of your parents has the disease, you also have a 50% chance of carrying the mutation. There is no cure for FFI. All doctors can do is make the patient as comfortable as possible and try to delay the inevitable. But I wouldn't let this keep you up at night. FFI is, after all, incredibly rare. There are only 70 families with FFI that we know of, and only about 300 cases of prion diseases are recorded in the United States every year. Sweet dreams. Thank you so much for watching until the end of this video. I've been wanting to make something about FFI for the longest time, and here we are. As someone who suffers from insomnia regularly, I think I have this disease like literally every other week. Sorry there weren't as many goofs in this video as my last two, but given that we're talking about an actual person, I didn't want to be too disrespectful. But you can get mad at me in the comments if I was. Okay, like, subscribe, whatever. Bye!